Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Avinder Sanhu. Uh, he's a, is an associate professor from uh, the Department of Physics and the College of Optical Sciences, so he's uh, our guy, local. Um, so um, Dr. Sanhu obtained his PhD in physics from the Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research um, in Mumbai and a Master uh, of Science in, in Physics uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, so he uh, worked uh, as a research uh, associate in Gila uh, in uh, University of Colorado from uh, 2004 to 2007 uh, before coming here uh, as a faculty member. So Dr. Senhu uh, is a recipient of the Korea Award from the uh, uh, National Science uh, uh, Foundation uh, and uh, the Excellence in Undergraduate Physics Teaching Award and also uh, the Young Scientist Medal from the Indian National uh, Science Academy. So Dr. Sanhu's research in interests are in other second uh, and femtosecond spectroscopy. Uh, these include uh, topics of electron dynamics in atoms and molecules, uh, strong fin physics, uh, non-adiabatic chemical dynamics, uh, ultra-fast processes uh, in nanomaterials, uh, intense laser plasma physics, and nonlinear spectroscopy, uh, all interesting stuff. So he's going to uh, tell us about other second spectroscopy of uh, complex systems today. Uh, okay, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. Um, uh, thanks for the invitation, and it's great to be um, here to give a talk. And uh, I'd like to make more trips back and forth. Of course, I collaborate with people here, and uh, but heat prevents it, so it's a good way to kind of come over. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to like. I'm going to share some of our results, which we have obtained over the last, uh, I would say, three years or so. And I gave a talk, I think, in 2011. So that so there's no overlap between this talk and that talk. And the work done here is, of course, done by students from both physics and optical sciences <coughs> departments. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to have good students uh, from both departments. Um, <coughs> I'll begin with. Uh, uh, general talk which I like to show, especially in colloquia. So what it shows here is um, various time scales uh, in orders of three orders of magnitude going from second to at a second. And the phenomena associated with those time scales <coughs> and the techniques you can use to measure those time scales. So uh, Below the resolution of human eye, the temporal resolution, you can use mechanical techniques or um, electronic strobing techniques to capture very fancy images. But if you want to really get down below that and you want to capture nanosecond dynamics or picosecond dynamics with, associated with rotational motions or femtosecond dynamics associated with vibrational motions of molecules, then you have to use lasers as your strobe light. And lasers have evolved from nanosecond to femtosecond, and femtosecond technology is a very mature technology. The question is, how mature is attosecond technology? And can one apply it in the same way that femtosecond spectroscopy is being applied right now? And what kind of problems you can address with attosecond spectroscopy? One obvious thing is that these pulses are sh so short that you can resolve the motion of electron in real time in atoms and molecules. So it does give us a new insight into electron dynamics. And you can not only measure, but you can also control electronic phenomena in real time. Right. So, <clears throat> so the, the, before we get into details of um, um, what you can do with a second sources, I'd like to explain how we generate them. And it's a pretty simple method. What you do is you take your femtosecond intense laser pulse and you focus it into a confined gas and you would generate very high harmonics of this fundamental radiation due to the nonlinearities in the gas and it's a non perturbative interaction these high harmonics would span from tens to hundreds of EVs and there's a comb of these frequencies and you might have heard of frequency combs here and the bandwidth and energy is so high that you can address not only valence electrons, which you can do with your femtosecond lasers, but you can also address inner electrons. And you can address all the electrons simultaneously because you have a huge bandwidth. Okay. And the reason you generate these harmonics 
is through this microscopic picture, which was proposed by Corcom and Colander in the early 90s. And the way it happens is that let's consider this green atomic Coulomb potential, which should be symmetric, but in the presence of a strong laser, it gets distorted. And it gets, gets distorted enough that the electron can actually tunnel out of the atom. And once it's in the continuum, it's under the influence of a laser field, which can accelerate it. And it, as the laser field changes sign, it can also bring it back. When it brings it back, it can recollide with the parent ion and this recollision process, smacking of electron against a core, is what produces this high energy radiation. Okay. And this radiation occurs every half laser cycle because every half laser cycle in red here, the electron is being driven out and back in, out and back in, out and back in. So half a laser cycle for typical <coughs> visible near infrared light is about one femtosecond. So this burst that's emitted it has to be less than a femtosecond. So it's an attosecond emission of light. But it's many bursts. So those of you, you who might be familiar with attosecond science would see the distinction here between many bursts and a single burst, a single pulse. And I'll come to that later. But for now, even these three, four bursts will occupy a region in time, a duration which is about three, four femtoseconds. And so it's a very short duration pulse, and it's very high energy. So let's see what we can do with it. Okay, uh, short duration clearly, as I mentioned, is 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 approaching the Bohr orbit time scale of electron in a hydrogen atom. All right. So um, let me now take a step back and kind of review the femtosecond laser applications, and it's everywhere. Okay, so since 1990s, uh, development of solid state technology. Um, the femtosecond lasers have permeated, of course, all branches of physics. There are books about it. In chemistry, there's a Nobel Prize on it. In biology, there are reviews on it. In industry, where you again have many applications. So it's widely applicable. You can buy it off the shelf, you can use it. So where does out of second science stand in terms of its prospects for such broad range of applications to many problems? So. To address that, let's um, review two things about attosecond pulses, which I have already stressed. Very short duration. Record is 67 attosecond, which is half the Bohr orbit time scale. And very high photon energies. Now, what's happening right now, which I won't spend too much time talking about, because that's not the main focus of our work, is that you could push the energies from hundreds of EVs to KEVs. And that will allow you to do water window biological imaging. Water has a window from about 300 to 500 EV where the carbon nitrogen is opaque. So you can do high contrast imaging uh, like synchrotrons do, okay, with high resolution. Uh, if you push the intensities higher, you can do multidimensional spectroscopies. You can do X ray Raman, you can do, uh, like, you can look at nonlinear couplings by do two dimensional spectroscopy. So if you have enough intensity. If you have higher power, you can do precision spectroscopy at megahertz rates, like Jason does with frequency combs. So all this is, is in the development. And it's not too far-fetched to assume that synchrotrons will, uh, you know, they, they have been extremely valuable way to do material, uh, to studies of materials and molecules. Now FELs are coming around because of the time resolution. So these attosecond tabletop sources might also come into a full kind of, uh, um, ma ma uh, they might mature to an extent that they would be applicable in many fields. Okay, so all these technologies are now kind of competing and complementing each other at the moment. All right. So my talk is more about what we can do with what we have already right now, not what we can develop further. Okay. So, and there has already been applications. People have applied um, attosecond pulses to are to understand how the electrons relax in atoms and molecules through um, autoionization, RJ decay, and people have measured these time scales. Also, um, this is an interesting example that I want to talk about, photoemission delays. So this is something we don't think too much about. So let's look at this picture here. This refers to this paper here, science paper. So if you ionize a neon atom by a 100 EV photon, and neon has two S electrons and two P electrons, they're in there, and 100 EV photon can ionize both of them. 
So the question was asked, is there any delay between when the 2S wave packet comes into the continuum or the 2P wave packet comes into the continuum? Okay, so this is kind of an abstract question. Um, we don't worry about it because it's, it's a minuscule time scale. But using attosecond techniques, you can actually measure this time delay. And if you look at emergence of uh, electron which corresponds to 2S ionization and 2P ionization, they have a group delay of about 20 attosecond. And this led to a lot of discussion like, is this real? Are we measuring it correctly? And similarly, someone measured how much time does it take for an electron to tunnel through a barrier? Okay? And that also, again, prompted a lot of controversy, like, is it a real time at all or not? So, and there have been applications in studying how dielectric changes to conductors in strong fields, how molecules fragment. But what's happening now is that all these applications were in simple atoms or simple molecules. The question is, can we take this to the next step and look for more complex dynamics? And that's what we are doing too, and that's what community is going towards as well. All right, so what kind of dynamics am I talking about here? So because everyone's complexity is different, what, what is complex for me might, might be very simple for you. <laughs> you know, it might be very simple for a biologist, for example. So, so I'll define my complexity, uh, what it is. So if, if you have an electron in some system, you can define its properties by defining a Hamiltonian, which is associated with some eigenenergies and some eigenfunctions, phi ns. And if you um, build a wave packet uh, of, uh, um, uh, by superposing various electronic eigenfunctions, you'd see that there's an evolution. And the system will evolve. The wave packet will move. Okay? And it can collapse and rephase depending on the phase differences. But that's, that's what I consider a, a more of a trivial dynamics. Okay. However, if you consider a possibility that there are other contributions to the Hamiltonian from presence of strong fields or through coupling of electrons with nuclear motion or in materials with phonons or couplings between correlations between electrons or between electrons and holes, now you have off-diagonal matrix elements in your Hamiltonian. And you could also have a mixture of these interactions. So now the Hamiltonian is complicated, and phi ends are no longer the stationary eigenstates of the problem. Right? So the dynamics that would happen now is non-trivial. So, and a priori, you may not know the coupling parameters or these matrix elements. So you might have to experimentally uh, figure it out what's happening to the electronic wave packet if these couplings are present. Okay? So this is the type of problems we are c considering where the electronic states couple to each other through various kind of correlations or couplings between electron nuclear motion or between uh, electrons in a many electron system. All right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions at any point. So, um, and these couplings are important. Even you know, in using femtosecond spectroscopy, people have tried to probe many interesting questions. For example, vision, how does it start? It starts by converting excitation energy of a photon into a change in the structure of a chromophore, so which leads to an isomerization, which is registered as a vision step. So people have looked at it. Light harvesting in photosynthesis, charge transfer across interfaces. These are all examples where couplings are important, and that's why the chemistry and biochemistry works. Right? So I don't have to stress this more. So, th so we are interested in, in kind of doing similar work in various kind of systems. And our technique is a pump probe scheme where you have an attosecond XUV pump. XUV is extreme ultraviolet because I have met very high energy photons. And it's a very short duration. It could range from 200 attosecond through 3 femtosecond pulse. And it prepares a spatially and temporally localized wave packet, which is our starting point. And then we can probe it later with a strong probe, which may have duration from 10 to 40 femtosecond, and this is generally an IR, infrared, or a visible probe, femtosecond pulse. And, in, and the way we implement it is that we have two beam lines, which in one case we have attosecond pulse train, which may initiate the dynamics, and then we have a probe pulse, which may act as a stop of the clock. Then we can break up the molecule and look at electron or ion fragments, or we may just do an optical spectroscopy where we watch how the attosecond pulse with its broad spectrum is getting absorbed as a function of time. So transient absorption in XUV regime. 
and we can spectros we can resolve it on a spectrometer. All right. So so that's our tools, and uh, in a nutshell. <coughs> and so now let me get to the topics that I want to cover today. So we have studied over the last four years problems involving various kind of couplings, strong field coupling, uh, coupling due to electronic correlations in a diatomic molecule, uh, electron hole coupling with nuclear motion near a conical intersection in a molecule, and then you know if you go to a material, the nuclear motion is of essentially phonons. So you can talk about electron phonon coupling in a material like graphene, which we have resolved in a similar context. Our charge migration in a large molecule driven purely by electronic correlations. This is something that we are working on right now. So I don't think I'll have time to talk about all of these topics. So I'll attempt only three today. If we get time, I'll show you a slide or two about the other two. Okay. So let's start at this diatomic molecule. See what kind of complication they can exhibit. All right. So, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but I feel tempted to explain this more, what a diatomic potential energy surface is. So if you have now an electron and two nuclei, two cores, it's a problem which is difficult to solve because nuclei are moving at the same time you're trying to solve for electrons' energies. So, but what saves us often is that nuclei are heavier. So you can use this Born-Oppenheimer approximation which says that uh, you can assume nuclei are frozen, fix an internuclear distance, and solve for electronic energies, and then fix another internuclear distance and solve for electronic energies again, and you get a potential energy curve. Okay, so that's where electrons should reside. All right. Now this is fine for low, for ground state, for low lying states. You know it works fine. But the thing, the whole thing breaks down when you pump too much energy into the system. Okay, that's a non-equilibrium situation, and uh, and you can no longer assume that electron and nuclear motion is uncoupled. When nuclei move, they can affect how electron moves, and the motion sometimes occurs on the same time scale. So now um, you end up with the situation where various potential energy surfaces intersect, like over here or over here. And these regions you cannot solve. You, you can diagonalize if you know the perturbation, and, you can lead, and this leads to some kind of avoided, avoided crossings. Okay, so, so Basically, if you, you really have to figure out what's going on, what kind of coupling is influencing your dynamics if I were to launch an electron wave packet here. So it's, it's a complex regime because of these couplings. But we have to understand, as I've already pointed out, because chemistry happens in this complex regime. <clears throat> okay, so, so let's pick a system. So we picked a system where there was too much energy stored in the system and there was a great likelihood of some complex behavior occurring. So the first example, which is the simplest of the three I'll talk about, is that you take an oxygen molecule, ignore these symbols and everything, just take an oxygen molecule in ground state, and take a 24 EV photon and excite it. And this 24 EV photon is 12 EV above the ionization threshold, so atom molecule should have ionized, but it doesn't, because there's a possibility that you can still keep the electron around if in if, if this is what you do, instead of ionizing the valence electron, you actually excite the inner electron. And now you have a system where system is still neutral, but it's excited, it's super excited, it has a lot of energy, 12 EV of excess energy that it has to get rid of. Okay. Now it could get rid of by just breaking up. These two dots, these cores can just fly apart, so you convert the energy to kinetic energy. Or you could have a situation where this electron relaxes down into the hole and this one goes into the continuum. And that's called auto-ionization. So both these processes can happen, they are relaxation channels and they can compete. So it's um, a situation which had a lot of interesting questions. So just to reiterate, auto-ionization process where the electron uh, essentially hops out of the system is an electronic correlation manifestation because all the electrons in the problem are interacting with that electron that has too much energy and they are asking it to leave the atom and let the others relax. Okay? And the same way, dissociation is a, is a manifestation of electron nuclear interactions because you're modifying the potential energy curve here and letting the electron, letting the molecule to leak out and break down. Okay? So if it breaks down, through neutral dissociation, 
what happens is that you end up with a neutral oxygen fragment. If it auto-ionizes, you end up with an ion. Okay? But if it breaks down, you get this oxygen atom here, which can collide with another oxygen if it was nearby, and form ozone. And this is exactly what happens in the atmosphere all the time when XUV photons from sun hit the upper atmosphere. Okay, so, so there is there is a ozone formation and decay channel, which is, which is again you know um, this is a representation of that channel. So, um, so it, it's a very interesting channel and it has been explored to death almost by synchrotrons, but there were still a few outstanding issues and I'll summarize them in just two lines. There was a huge discrepancy in the dissociation lifetime of a certain vibrational level. You know, initially it was like four orders of magnitude, then it came down to about two orders of magnitude discrepancy, okay? And, it, 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 and the reason discrepancy was there is because it was difficult to disentangle the two mechanisms. So we thought we should try. And, um, and we did an experiment where we excited the uh, temporally localized wave packet to this um, excite, super excited state, and we watched how it breaks up and how it auto-ionizes downwards by using a probe step here to sample how much population is left over in that excited state. So it's a pump probe study where you watch how much is left over. And, and whenever you ionize, whenever you use this probe step to ionize, you end up with a the, with the very specific energy, kinetic energy oxygen ions. So this left side is no probing, right side is probing, and you see this kinetic energy fragments. And you can pick one of these fragments and watch its yield as a function of time delay as you change the time delay between the blue pulse and the red pulse, the arrow-second pulse and the probing pulse. So, <clears throat> so that was our simple measurement. And we did a whole lot of measurements, but this, is, this, is, this kind of represents what we, what we tried to achieve. The probe pulse here is about 35 femtoseconds wide. <clears throat> and the excitation pulse is about 3 to 4 femtoseconds. Uh, we do autocorrelation. Like we pick an atom like helium, and we do a cross-correlation, and we see where the ionization maximizes in that atom. And that cross-correlation peak tells us where our zero is. <clears throat> right. So good. Okay, so, um, so fine. So, so if we could model this data, we could, uh, um, we could understand what the, the various rates are. Okay? And there is a kinetic model that you can build based on the uh, auto-ionization rate and the dissociation rate and the probing step that we are forcing on it. And I will not go into the details of this either. Uh, if you believe me, I'll just tell you that the yield as a function of time depends on the ratio between the dissociation rate and the auto-ionization rate. So, so, there, and so that's, that's what we came up with. It's a simple model. But we had to test its validity. So, so we went and thought, like, what is a good check to see if this is a good way to think about the problem? So the, the, the trick is that uh, the, the fragmentation of this system or, or, the, or the relaxation of the system should depend on the effective quantum number, n star. n star because it's an effective quantum number which includes the quantum defect due to all the electronic correlations that are present in the system averaged. Okay. So the, the quantum defect theory predicts that auto-ionization lifetime should scale as n star cubed. It should go up. And there is a core ion approximation which assumes that dissociation should be independent of the quantum number. So wherever the electron is, the nuclei are going to break up the same way. So that should be flat with quantum number. So depending on where you are, you might get a decay. Or if you are here, you might get a step function in your ion yield. And so we tried this, and we checked that if we excite low to mid n quantum number super excited states, we get a decay. If you go to high numbers, we get a step function. So that gave us confidence that we are approaching the problem correctly. And uh, <clears throat> so we applied our uh, analysis to the decay and extracted two independent numbers, the auto-ionization lifetime of uh, uh, 5S um, electron. So it's kind of a Rydberg electron, which is equivalent to a 5S electron which is attached to an oxygen molecule. And the pre-dissociation lifetime. So we obtain, this is a derived number. This is not independent. So we, we obtained two independent variables out of this study. And uh, there was 
<clears throat> no experiment to compare with for autoionization, but there was a theoretical calculation uh, done in 2007, and our number was very close to their number, surprisingly close, actually. Um, now, they could, you know, we didn't look at electrons specifically, so we could not resolve which is 5s electron and 4d electron, so, but they, theory could, so we, we give a, a average number, and they could separately resolve the 5s and 4d electrons. Uh, auto-ionization lifetime. And the predissociation time seems to match this number here more so than these, and it's close to the bound set by this. So, so we, we, felt, we felt good that, you know, this kind of our work can address some questions which were outstanding in the field in the, in the, in the um, XUB studies of molecules. All right. So, but <clears throat> in this work, um, um, in this work, I have not given you any quantitative information about any correlation or coupling. It was just a pump probe study to look at lifetimes. So, and I want to do that, but at the same time, I want to increase the complexity of my problem as well. So, instead of uh, working with a diatomic molecule, which has only one internuclear degree of freedom, uh, let's look at uh, polyatomic molecules, which have many more degrees of freedom. They can bend, they can stretch, okay? So now, instead of a curve, you have surfaces. And in the case of a curve, you could rediagonalize your Hamiltonians for same symmetry electronic states such that you get avoided crossings. But here, you may not be able to lift the degeneracy completely, so you get something called conical intersections where two surfaces intersect. Okay? And these conical intersections are important in chemistry and biochemistry. And I already told you about vision, but also let me give you another example: protection of DNA uh, nuclear bases. So if you put a UV photon into your DNA, the electron has so much energy that it can auto-ionize the system, and you can then fragment the DNA, which is harmful, of course. But there's a channel in which electronic energy can be dissipated by going through these conical intersections, where electron loses its energy slowly and you prevent the damage to your DNA. So these conical intersections are a non-radiative means of giving away energy or without fragmenting. And there are other examples too. So it's a, it's a very important concept. So, and in this case, we could actually get some quantitative information. So I'll share that with you next. So any questions so far? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so that's the problem. We'll attempt measurement of electron nuclear couplings. And uh, the system we chose to do this, again, um, is simple for a chemist or a biologist, but for a physicist, it's pretty complex already, CO2. Okay. So um, the, if you take CO2 molecule, it has many electrons. It has, two, it has three cores. And if you remove electrons from the outermost orbital, the valence, you would get a cation, CO2 plus ion. If you remove electron from pi u, you'll get A state. If you remove electron from sigma u, you get B state. If you remove electron from sigma g, you get C state. Okay? And the two states of interest to us are A and B because they intersect here. And A corresponds to a pi hole in the system, which means it's, uh, the electron is disappearing from the pi orbital. So the pi orbital hole exists. Here there's a sigma orbital hole for the B state. So there are two different electronic characters or two different hole characters in the problem, all right? So, and uh, if you draw the full multidimensional uh, picture, you see that it's the surfaces that are intersecting. And the reason, and this conical intersection is there, uh, and, and it's not just a, uh, and it's actually a, a, a more complex conical intersection that you would normally encounter, because it, invo it involves something called bilinear vibronic coupling, which means that it's not just one motion of the nuclei, that leads to um, coupling between electrons and nuclei. It's two motions. The CO2 molecule stretches, asymmetrically stretches, and bends at the same time for this kind of conical intersection to materialize. So it's a bilinear coupling between electrons and nuclei. OK. So, um, so again, uh, we do a, our experiment with add a second XUV pump. We produce selectively a sigma hole in the problem, and the sigma hole is then coupled to the pi hole state because of the presence of nuclear motion. Okay? 
So there is interaction between these two states. And at the same time, we can come with our IR probe and monitor how much sigma whole character is left in the system by exciting it further to C state, which then breaks into CO plus ions, which we can measure as a function of time delay. So we can monitor how much sigma whole character is there in the system as a function of time. All right. So, um, so we obtain data, and uh, what? It, and again, you know, <clears throat> I just stick to one set of data. What it shows us is here. Here is that it's CO plus ion yield as a function of time delay for two different cases. Two polarizations are parallel, and they're perpendicular for pump and probe. We're going to ignore this for now. Let's focus on this. So there are oscillations that we see here. There's a decay, and of course, there's a large difference between this and this. So the oscillations are, are a very striking aspect of this data. Let's focus on that first. So let's subtract this DC, our slow variation, slow decay, and obtain the oscillatory part of the signal and normalize it as well to the DC so that we have some idea of what the amplitude of oscillations is. And you see that there's a nice periodic oscillation with the decaying amplitude in our signal. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> the reason uh, behind this oscillation is again goes back to the coupling okay, that I talked about between electrons and nuclei. And the two coordinates, the asymmetric stretch and the bending, which couple the A state with the pi hole and the B state with the sigma hole, and this corresponds to an off-diagonal matrix element in your Hamiltonian. So if you have this coupling, your A and B states are no longer the eigenstates. You could re-diagonalize, do a representation transformation, and go from A, B vibronic states to new stationary eigenstates, phi plus and phi minus. And this theta angle here is called the mixing angle, and it's direct measure of the strength of this coupling matrix element. Okay. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so if you, now if you have uh, some time dependence in the system, uh, you can write the wave function in terms of these eigenstates, and depending on the energies and the initial amplitudes, you will see an evolution of the system. And from this wave function, we can calculate the probability for the system to be in the B character by breaking it up and looking at yield of CO plus ions. And you can do an analytical estimate of how the yield of CO plus ions should vary as a function of the mixing angle and the energies of the two eigenstates. And clearly, the, it just comes out directly from this expression that there should be a beating in the problem with the frequency corresponding to the energy difference between the two states which are mixed together. So this E plus minus E minus, um, it, it gives rise to the beat that we see here. And if you do the full numerical calculation, multi-configurational time-dependent heart rate calculation, which our collaborators did, you get the same frequency beat that's predicted by this analytical model. Okay? And, and not just that, um, well, uh, okay, hold on. So, so of course, the, the peaks, if you do FFT, the peaks match as well for black theory and the, red, and the blue experiment. Experimental peak is, of course, broad because there is change in the amplitude and the period. Okay. So, all right, so, <clears throat> so now it, it's, it's a good place to kind of summarize again once we are doing so that you're with me. So what we are seeing here in this data is that I produced a sigma hole which suddenly, well not suddenly, slowly changed to a pi hole over here, predominantly pi hole, and then back to sigma and then back to pi. So the hole is oscillating back and forth between two different orbital characters. And while the hole is oscillating, and the simulations here show that, that this electron density from the axis, this, this blue means lack of electron density here, it's going away from here and appearing into this pi orbitals over here. So the electron is sloshing to the pi orbital. At the same time, you excite the bending and the asymmetric stretch modes of your nuclei. So at the same time, you're bending and stretching your molecule while the electron is oscillating. All right, so, so we could, uh, so that this data here captures these complicated dynamics. And now um, we can get to the point of, can we measure this coupling? So the theory predicts a f you know, constant amplitude. There should be no decrease in, uh, in this amplitude. And the amplitude, if you look at this expression here, the amplitude of this oscillation is, a, is related to the angle theta. So if you divide this by this, you'll get the amplitude. And the amplitude relates to the coupling matrix element. So the theory predicts 
mixing angle should be 0.195, which corresponds to certain strength of the coupling. Now, experiment observes a decay in the amplitude. So does that mean that electron nuclear coupling is decreasing with time? Or is the outgoing photoelectron interacting with the system? Or there's something else going on? That's, that's what we set out to find next. So um, let's uh, um, actually uh, compute the amplitudes and plot them for each oscillation as a function of time. And I plot the amplitudes here, and they're linearly decaying. And if I go back to 0, there should be no damping mechanism at zero time delay. Okay? So I can assume that whatever is the amplitude at zero time delay, I can compare with theoretical amplitude here. So I do that, and I find that uh, uh, the experimental amplitude, 0.183, matches the theoretical amplitude fairly well. So we can measure this mixing angle theta in this problem where we could compute theta. In the problem where you can't compute theta, this might be a good way to measure theta, which means you can measure the couplings. So we could get a good handle on this quantitative information which was lacking. All right, so, so now why is the amplitude decaying again? Let's get back to that question. And the answer turned out to be after, you know, some guidance from the referee and some back and forth, <laughs> we figured out that simplest explanation was the best one, actually. So the, the issue was that uh, we have a fairly warm starting point. We have a, you know, a set of ox uh, carbon dioxide molecules which are sitting at about 200 Kelvin. And when you excite them and you remove them, you produce uh, these vibronic states, A and B, which are coherent with each other, but they have a substructure which is set of rotational levels which are thermally populated. So all these red states are thermally incoherent, all these green states are thermally incoherent with each other. So even though you have pairs of coherently evolving oscillators, which are beating, there is a series of these oscillators, and the oscillators are mutually incoherent. So you lose the phase relationship as a function of time between these oscillators, and that's what gives rise to this decay. And uh, so once we knew that, we included it in our theoretical models, and it did um, fall along the same kind of linear decay behavior as we expected. All right, so, so that's what, what we got in this case for electron nuclear couplings. And uh, let me see what I have next. Yes, so, so, this, so we were actually very excited about this coherence aspect. Why is the coherence decaying? And I'll tell you why we were excited. Because, because recently there has been a lot of controversy about this topic of coherence or even room temperature coherence in photosynthetic systems. So the idea is that if you have a photon hitting some antenna in your photosynthetic complex. And the antenna absorbs the energy, and you know, previous understanding was that it semi-classically transfers the excitation down to the reaction center where the energy is needed. Okay? But these publications here, um, the reference here, and a few others show that this process is actually coherent. They're the wave function spans the entire complex, and the, and the energy is transferred coherently okay, through interferences. And the coherences last very long for picoseconds at 77 Kelvin and for, uh, for about 200 femtoseconds, even at room temperature. So the, the, in biology, there's coherence. So the energy is transferred through coherences. So that's why we were excited to see if our problem had that kind of quantum coherence aspect to it, that we are observing the decay of coherence. Um, so so if now, now the question is, if we could freeze the rotational motion we could look at this kind of quantum coherence effect. So we are, there's still room to explore more in this direction. OK. All right, so let's, let me come to the last topic now. I guess I have about 10 more minutes, 10, 15 more minutes. Khan? Yeah? OK, so, so we are doing good on time then. So the next topic is forget nuclear motion. Let's just see how electrons interact with each other and how it can lead to interesting, um, how, it, how it can manifest in interesting ways. So, and this is something that's ongoing, so we haven't worked out all the kinks. But what we are doing now is moving from femtosecond uh, resolved studies with XUV pulses to something faster, where it's purely electrons interacting with each other, and the time scale is expected to be faster. So the question is, can we resolve this? And the theorists are, were ahead of um, all of us, and they already were calculating such electron correlation-driven de charge migrations many years back. So the idea is that if you have 
uh, large molecule, and you can create holes, localized holes, on one end of this penna molecule, phenyl, ethyl, N, N, dimethylamine molecule, and you can create a hole here, or a hole here. Um, the holes, in reality, will not have this pure character. You won't have this hartree fock orbitals. These holes will get mixed together because of electronic correlation. So if you create an excitation at ATV, it'll have some character of blue type, this hole, some character of green type in the middle hole here, red type over here. So holes will mix together. So electronic correlations will create non-stationary holes in the system, which will move around. And um, the motion is very fast. And this is no nuclear motion, because nuclear will take a lot of time to move. So within four femtosecond, hole created on one side of the molecule can move to the other side and back and forth. So it's a, it's a nice um, thing if we could verify it, you know. But the problem is manifold. Uh, Penna is solid at room temperature, so we could not get into our vacuum chamber and kind of have some gas there of Penna molecules. And more importantly, you know, we need a resolution of one femtosecond, two femtosecond type here. And so we need a uh, right now we have like three, four at a second XUV burst and uh, and uh, te and uh, 20, 30 femtosecond probing pulse. That's not good enough. So we had to first figure out how to produce a better at a second pulse, and that's an exercise in in optical engineering or design. So obvious way of doing this is that uh, what you can do is instead of using a long driver pulse, which is 30, 40 femtosecond, and producing bursts of this at a second pulse pulses, you use it. 8 femtosecond driving pulse, and then you'll produce only 2-3 bursts. And that's about 1.5, 2 femtosecond wide pulse of blue radiation overall. So, and this can be achieved. You know, generating a shorter red pulse, you guys might know of self-phase modulation. So you increase the bandwidth of your laser through nonlinearities, and then you compress the bandwidth back and go from 40 femtosecond to about 8.5 femtosecond in our lab. So we, we achieved that. So, so that's something that we can do. We can go to very short pulses and obtain just a few at a second bursts. But that still may not be good enough for the ultimate goal. So how do you get a single at a second pulse? And not just like three bursts or two bursts, single at a second pulse. And you can do that if you could gate the emission of this XUV radiation to just one half cycle. If you could say, no harmonic emission at other times, just one half cycle will produce the radiation that I need. And, and, and the way to do it is called double optical gating, or DOG method, proposed by Zheng Hu, uh, who's in Florida now. So it's a very cute technique. The idea is uh, you take two perpendicular fields, which have delay relative to each other. So black and red are perpendicular fields. And you pass them through a quarter wave plate. So they're perpendicular to each other. Quarter wave plate axis is right, is right in the middle, and what you end up with the two counter rotating circular polarizations, LCP and RCP on the uh, tail end and the rising end of your laser pulse. And the circular polarization is good for us in the sense that if you are trying to produce this radiation, you you want to hit the atom with your electron. But if you don't want to produce it, you want to miss it. And if you have circular polarization, you will miss the atom and you will not produce the radiation. So you'll miss the radiation here, you'll miss it here, but in between, it's linear here. Over here, you will produce your attosecond pulse. So you can generate about a one cycle gate using this technique. But even that's not good enough. One cycle gate means in this one cycle gate here, you have two half cycles, and each half cycle will produce an electron, bang it back, produce attosecond emission, produce it again. So there are two bursts. How do you localize it to just one burst? So what you do is you break this symmetry between the two half cycles by using a little bit of second harmonic. So you add a weak amount of blue field to your red pulse and phase match it and group delay match it so that the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle have asymmetric amplitudes. So now only one of them will produce the radiation that you're interested in. So you can um, get a single attosecond pulse that you're interested in, which is um, ideal for um, the type of electron correlation experiments we are trying to do. All right, so, and so this is uh, something that, uh, uh, well, the sketch is something like this. So 
you start with the red pulse, you split it with the quartz plate into two perpendicular delayed polarizations, and then you use a quarter wave plate here with axes right in between them to produce two counter rotating circular polarized light pulses. And then you use a BBO here and produce a little bit of blue, and you end up with the electric field which looks weird and it goes like this, then it becomes straight, and then it goes again like that. So now you produce your single arrow second pulse with this field. Okay. All right, so, so we tried this, and remember, this is the type of harmonics we had before. So we have this kind of nice, straight, uh, comb-like harmonics corresponding to many attosecond bursts. It's a periodicity in time and periodicity in frequency. Now we put our gate, and we have very recently done this, and we are trying to make sure it, we can do it every time we try to do it. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not kind of easy for us right now, but if you do it properly, you can suddenly constrict the emission to one half cycle and the spectrum becomes a continuous burst of radiation. And then if you Fourier transform the spectrum, it corresponds to about 430 at a second emission. Okay? And if you do it in argon gas instead of xenon, you get even broader supercontinuum of XUV light and that corresponds to about 250 attosecond pulse. And we can prove that this is 250 femtosecond, hopefully soon with, by doing a, um, a measurement which, uh, uh, which I don't discuss here. Uh, but even getting this far, there are only few labs in the world which have this kind of capability, maybe four. So it's, it's kind of like a really frontier area of attosecond science. All right, so we have one ingredient. We have short attosecond pulses and we have a short probing pulse, 8 femtosecond. But still, uh, Pena molecule was a problem. So, uh, so my student, Henry Tivers, came up with a list of things which we could try, and iodobenzene is what he has identified as a good candidate. And it has a situation where you have iodine on one end and phenyl group on the other end, and you can ex create a localized excitation on the phenyl group or iodine group and see if electronic correlations make the, um, the electron uh, go back and forth between the two different excitations. And we expect the time scale for this motion to be about 15 femtoseconds, so it might be resolvable using our existing tools that we have developed. So, so that's the proposed experiment that we are working on. In fact, we'll try two things. Uh, we could pump this molecule and create a localized excitation with XUV, probe with IR, and look at iodine ions or electrons, or we could create an excitation on the phenyl group with multi-photon ionization with IR and look at transient absorption of XUV light on iodine and see if it deviates from its static behavior as a function of time. If the electron density is going to move from here to there, you might see change in absorption on the iodine atom. And we'll pick a specific iodine edge to, uh, to do it elementally specific uh, experiment. All right. All right, so... So a lot of interesting stuff. One can actually branch out and see if vibrations now interact with the electronic correlations by changing the hydrogens to fluorines or changing the iodine to bromine and see if, if you change the vibrational period, does it affect your electronic correlations or not? But uh, that's still uh, out in the future, so we'll try that. Um, I think um, what I want to do is show you my last slide or two here. and. Uh, so what, what we envision, and that's what we, uh, you know, as a community I'm talking about, is that the atosecond spectroscopy might be right at the threshold where, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of a, of a breakthrough here could make it into a mainstream spectroscopic technique. And there are already, you know, experiments like we have done, others have done, looking at interfacial charge transfer in, in, uh, in um, ruthenium complex on zinc oxide, and people have looked at magnetization dynamics in thin films. So um, one can look at uh, electron correlations like Cooper pairs and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are like carbon-based organic molecules. So this is something that we are also envisioning of doing. And in fact, we are uh, gearing towards setting up a new atosecond beam line for this kind of stuff. So we'll see how uh, far we can take this. All right. So. Um, let me summarize now, remind you what I've talked about. So we have talked about a situation with a super excited oxygen molecule and measured its auto-ionization lifetime, which was not known, and the competing predissociation rate. We have looked at electron hole dynamics near a conical intersection, which is an interesting 
uh, object for uh, working of life. You know, you need conical intersections for life to work. And we resolved the oscillation of electron hole back and forth between two different orbitals and measured the coupling between electronic states and quantified it. And we also measured the evolution of coherence, which, which, which in this case might be um, not such an interesting uh, deduction in this case because it's thermal effect. But in some cases, it could be very interesting if it's quantum coher decoherence effect. Now, we're working on electron correlation-driven charge migrations. And we have created, um, we think we have created isolated attosecond pulses. We have the supercontinuum. We have the all set, right set of tools. And we are using iodobenzene as a test bed to test those um, uh, charge migration dynamics. And the work that I presented here was done by, um, uh, helped by a lot of people, but mostly done by Henry Timmers, um, who is graduating soon. And he already has a job at LBL. And he's, he's interested enough in this work that he's going to continue it and uh, develop it further. And, uh, but we are doing, as I said, um, work in materials like graphene, which Dheeraj is doing, uh, effect of strong field couplings on um, dynamics, which Chenting is doing. And we have uh, new students coming into the lab who are trying all this. Some of my old students have uh, done work in graphene and in uh, strong fields. And they are at different places now. The theory was helped by uh, Robin Santra's group from CFL in Germany. And we are working with other theory groups on, um, atom, on atoms and on materials in OPSI and in physics and on uh, materials experiments in uh, physics as well and funded by NSF and importantly, through photonics, imaging, and uh, ARM research. Thank you very much. Where 